Sure. So welcome, Si Chong Chen, who's he visiting here um, as a faculty candidate. Many of you have met with him, um, have already had some really great, fun interactions. Uh, he's visiting currently at a, a postdoc at Harvard University. Before that, he did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and that was after his PhD, which was at the University of Minnesota, which he got in 2018. And um, he did his undergrad degree at Nanjing, China. So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chong. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tong Chen. Good afternoon. And uh, thank Amy, uh, James, for organizing this wonderful visit. Uh, so I'm, uh, in the last couple of years, I've been working on, I'm generally interested in all the gas and uh, particles in the atmosphere. So in the last couple of years, I've been working on greenhouse gas, like CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and also air pollutants, like ammonia, uh, carbon monoxide in the atmosphere, using measurements from uh, tall towers, aircraft data, and also satellite observations, and of course, models. So uh, today, I want to present you methane, one of my recent favorite topic. I want to talk about how can we use satellite data to better understand methane emissions about its source, its trend, and also it's about its implication <coughs> for climate actions. So methane is a potent greenhouse gas. For a really long time, if you look at this IPCC beautiful figure here, for a long time, methane has been talking as a little brother of CO2. But turns out, if you look at this figure, <coughs> not so little. This is uh, the global warming since the uh, pre-industry era. So methane actually con contributes to 46, 46 uh, degree warming uh, for the globe. Actually, in fact, it is responsible for 30% of global warming. And unfortunately, if you look at the right panel, the figure here, that shows the methane concentration in the unit of particle building, PPB, in the atmosphere. I was born in the early 1990s, and at that time, the concentration of methane is increasing crazily. And then all of a sudden, around the year 2000, you see the concentration becomes flat. Everyone is happy. And after a couple of years, around the year 2006, it becomes increased again, and uh, at roughly 6 ppb per year. And then more recently, the growth rate becomes even larger, 9 ppb. And uh, to the last couple of years, three or four years, it's increased actually even at an even higher rate. We call it a missing search. There are all scientists from the world in fighting against each other on this topic. I'm part of it. I'll go back to this uh, picture later. So why missing? There are so many gas in the atmosphere. Why do we, do I care about missing at all? So missing is the best lever to reduce the near-term global warming. There are many two reasons. Two reasons. So it has a much shorter lifetime than CO2. Methane has a lifetime in the atmosphere for like roughly 10 years, while CO2 is easily more than 100 years. So if you reduce the CO2 emissions from today, you actually probably handle the CO2 reduced emission which is emitted 100 years ago. But if you uh, reduce methane emissions today, you have an immediate climate benefit tomorrow. And also, it's about its, uh, its ability to trap in heat. So one kilogram of methane, it has the ability to trap heat that's 80 times more than one kilogram of CO2. So it, you can see it's cost effective. And uh, recently, globally, internationally, getting uh, more and more attention about uh, reduced methane emissions. The uh, Paris Climate Agreement, which uh, sets the goal uh, by the end of this century, century we want to uh, limit the temperature to be 1.5 C. This is a climate goal, the tipping point. And uh, methane is recognized as a priority for it. More recently, in 2021, uh, the Global Methane Pledge, which is a, a pledge leading by countries uh, like the United States and the European Union, and uh, they decide to work together to reduce methane by 30% at a year by the end of 2030 compared to 2020 levels. But as of today, I just checked, 155 countries have signed the pledge to, for the commitment. Because of this commitment, what does it mean? It means that we need more transparency for the data. We didn't know, like for US, we want to know how much medicine is being emitted from this year, from this country. So we need transparency. What we do is all these countries, they commit for the commitment, 
they are requested to report their emissions to the United Nations uh, Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. Remember this term. It will be mentioned again and again. So using this, we can track the progress of a country's uh, uh, medicine regulations failure or being successful. Uh, many countries are doing a lot of effort. Taking US, for example, uh, last year, immediately after COP28, last December 2023, so the US EPA, Environmental Pro uh, Protection Agency, and the DOE, they announced a $1 billion uh, funding in, in for the methane mitigation. The tons of money, and uh, we got to see how it can be used to reduce methane emissions. So, speaking of methane, where is methane even from? That's the tricky part. Methane is emitted from many sources, naturally or anthropogenically. And I'll start from the very right part. It's a wetland. Wetland, uh, you're probably from more familiar than me. In Florida, around the coastline, a lot of mangroves that give you methane emissions. And uh, uh, wetland also uh, largely distributed over the tropics and also the boreal. The idea for methane to produce uh, methane is uh, the, the water cuts off the oxygen supply to the soil and the organic matter decay. To, and then methane is produced as a very important byproduct. That's basically how it works. That's the largest, single largest source, natural source, that's wetland. Then you have livestock. You are probably more familiar with livestock. Methane is produced in your cow's stomach. That's actually the same theory working, on, uh, working as the, the, the wetland. So oxygen getting cut off from a cow's oxygen or getting make it a decay, that gives you methane. So, and uh, in the livestock sector, there's a uh, uh, cow's stomach, cow and broken up with your methane. Meanwhile, meanwhile they are the manure management, which is also a big part of the uh, agriculture source. And then you have the oil and the natural gas, uh, which is the methane gas directly from the oil gas business. For example, there's a natural gas pipeline. If there's a leakage, then that's methane for you. And meanwhile, you, if you uh, drive around Pennsylvania somewhere during the night, you see the flaring. That is uh, for an oil gas company. They take the oil and then they don't want the natural gas. So what do they do? Uh, they just set fire on it. That is flaring on it. But most of the time, the flaring is insufficient. Means a lot of methane being just directly leaked. And also the venting. Venting is clearly ball wasted. Just let the natural gas go. So that's a big source. Also, one of the biggest things for the US. And then there's the coal mining. The coal mining, uh, the idea is while you dig the coal, there's also a lot of gas in the coal mining. You really need to vent it out because it's dangerous. People working there suffer from danger. So there's a venting shaft going on 24 7 that give you a light source. And China is the biggest coal mining medicine source. And then, of course, there's an urban source for landfill and wastewater, the same idea working from the wetland and livestock. And then, last but not least, it's, that's rice. Rice is a, one of the biggest things in China and also in uh, uh, California, Louisiana too in the US. It, it, it's called man-made wetland, so it works the same as a wetland. So given all of this, that uh, all kinds of thoughts all contribute to uh, massive emissions, contribute to global warming, that makes the question really complicated. What's been more difficult is all these sources are highly uncertain. Like how much is being there globally, it's a high uncertainty. Also, their special distribution, their similarity, they're all uncertain. That, but that gives me motivation. That's my biggest motivation to work on this. Can I know better about all these sub sectors? So in one single sentence, <coughs> my motivation to study medicine is I want to use satellite data and models to better understand the medicine emissions at a different spatial and temporal scale, such to better guide the climate action. There are three topics I want to talk about today. Three topics driven by three different questions. The first one is, I, want, I wonder how can we use satellite data over uh, mass environment to infer basic emissions at a really high resolution for our, and by different source sectors. I will use uh, one example of the Middle East and North Africa and taking oil and gas as a, a focus to talk about it. This is a map we use the satellite to infer. The figure here shows the mass emissions the red, the orange, red-ish color give you high emissions. The blue or uh, green-ish give you low emissions. I'll come back to this figure many times later. The second topic, as I just mentioned, scientists are fighting over this figure, what's been explaining the search and in the recent uh, years. I want to 
talk about how well can we explain this search using our current knowledge. And for the third one, it's, um, I just talked about the, the lack of uncertainty in the, the rice, legs, wetlands. One of the biggest uncertainty lies in, we don't know where the rice is, we don't know where the wetland is, we don't know how it grows from season to season. So here I use a land imaging satellite, which doesn't observe this thing clearly, but how it can it be used to help us better understand methane emissions. There are three topics I want to cover today. Go to the first one. I just talked about the, the oil and gas it being a really big source globally and also for many regions. And we want to reduce the oil and gas emissions. And uh, actually, reduce uh, basic emissions from the oil and gas it can be reduced at uh, almost net zero cost using existing technologies. I just talked about uh, the flaring and venting, uh, venting the big source. And actually, using existing technology, we can just capture it. We capture it, okay, use it as energy. And for the oil gas companies, they can also use it to make money. It's a win-win. And uh, also, there's a gas, uh, pipeline leakage. And if we are able to repair this pipeline, and uh, the detect these leaks, it doesn't look that much effort. Th those are examples like we at a net zero cost to reduce oil gas emissions. So reducing oil gas is really, really appealing. That makes my study region here, the Middle East and uh, North Africa, a very attractive target region. Because look at the, the orange map here, there are 23 countries here. And uh, they have many countries that, that have been very big oil gas producers the Algeria in North Africa, the Saudi Arabia, Turkmenistan. And for this region, in 2019, they account for 32% of global oil production and also 24% of your global gas production. And indeed, if you look at the left panel here, this is from the UNFCCC, the term I just mentioned, like a country need to report their emissions to the United Nations. Uh, this figure is compiled from my colleague, Tia Scarpelli, and based on this figure, it shows more than 13 out of 48 terawatt, it's more than a quarter oil gas emissions are from this region. So, but we think about how this figure is being compiled. It's using an uh, inventory. The emission inventory is simply compiled with this calculation here. Inventory equals production activity times emission factors. So a country reports its production. We don't know. They might report a low, high value. They might even don't even know how exactly how much is being produced. And also, emission factor could also show a really large range. And the, the right panel figure here, I shows for different countries as a y-axis. And uh, the different inventories have been used. <coughs> they report quite a big range. Take example for Saudi Arabia. The range being reported by oil gas emission range from 0.3 to 3, 10 times difference. That's huge. But it's okay. There's are Iraq. They're reporting from smaller than 0.1 to 10. There's a 100 times difference. Based on this, which value should we even use to use as a, a baseline so we can set the climate uh, mitigation goals? We don't know, right? This high uncertainty gives us really difficult time to set the reduction strategy. Here comes satellite data. Satellite in water can be used to substantially reduce such uncertainty. How it works, how a satellite uh, inverse model can be used uh, as a top down constraint to give us better confidence in massive emissions. The figure here is a, a bottom up like UFCCC inventory. It has high uncertainty, remember that. And then, meanwhile, we have satellite data which are uh, far away from us and then observe the column average methane in the atmosphere. So, what do we do? we pass these emissions, surface emissions, through a chemistry transport model. It could be GeoScan or Wolf. WolfCam you are more familiar with. Then this transport model relates these emissions to concentrations. Then putting through this model, what do we get? We get a predicted concentration of the, of the, the methane concentrations. Then we compare with, with our model concentration with the real observations. Most of the time, they are different. They have a large difference. That's why, where we can correct. We compare the difference and we put it into an inverse model. The inverse model will tell us, okay, for this region, for example, this area really should be larger. This area should be really be much smaller for each grid box. Then we correct the bottom inventory. After the correction, we get an optimized estimate. 
if we put this optimized estimate through the transport model, wolf cam to cam again, the, the model concentration will be much better fitted to the observation. That's basically how a inverse model works using satellite data. So speaking of satellite data, we are actually in a good time. There are two broad categories for satellite data. It's one called point source images. If you look at this figure here, this is satellite data. They only target very small dots, very small regions, like a, a pipeline uh, leak, like an oil gas being blown out. That's the size you look at, very dotted, small uh, source. Meanwhile, you have this area flux uh, images. They orbit the Earth. They give you global regional coverage, but they don't spot the target regions. What they do, they observe the entire region, entire, let's say, North America, entire Permian Basin, entire Miami City. Then it can be used to give you a regional overall uh, like uh, estimate of the total emission from the city, from uh, the state, from the country. The, but the downside is, is the pixel is really close. The pixel is much uh, close, like a 100 meter to 10 kilometer pixels. That's the downside. So how many of these satellites are being available to us right now? Look at this figure. It's really fantastic. So we are really in a good time. There are a uh, bunch of satellites being, that being some of them is, is working right now, some of them are being planned, so they're probably going on next year or in the next two years. So today, I want to focus on one of my favorites, it's called Topomi. The Topomi satellite data, it's launched in 2017. It's launched by European Space Agency, ESA. So uh, the data has been available since 2018 to today. It's still going on every day. The advantage of it is it has a global continuous daily coverage. So you basically can have data over at Miami every day, if it's not cloudy. And uh, it has a really fine pixel at roughly uh, 7 kilometer uh, resolution. So look at the left panel here, shows the concentration for annual mean for 2019. This for the middle is uh, North uh, Africa. So the, the, high, uh, the orange color gives you high concentrations. The uh, orange or blue-ish give you, uh, sorry, the, uh, the blue-green-ish uh, give you the, the low concentrations. We can tell from, let's say, Saudi Arabia, there's a high concentration here. Meanwhile, this area is the Sahara Desert. We know nothing going on there, so it makes sense the concentration is low. Look at the right panel, which shows the number density. Back to show over the year, how many retrievals are being available over one grid cell. So look at the figure. It's basically a full coverage over almost everywhere. So give you give us really good coverage. So we have high confidence in using this satellite data to constrain every little bit of this region. And uh, meanwhile, one setup of our model is we directly use the UFCCC report as a prior emission. If you remember that map, if we use UFCCC as a prior, then our satellite data directly evaluate this UFCCC report. So this is a prior setup here. So it makes sense for different source sectors. So it makes sense we have a high, high emission of oil, gas, not much going on of coal in the Middle East, North Africa region, the livestock is also a big thing, and of course, land field, waste water. As long as it's city, the urban area, it gives you uh, the, the urban emissions, and the rice, wetland, not so much. And the, we run the model using GeoScan. It has, uh, for us, a really high resolution, 0.25 degree, roughly 25 kilometer. Is it the same scale for each of the, the color scale is the same for each yeah, of the Yes, panels? yes. It's a, it's a log, log scale. Okay. Yes. And uh, so, what we can deliver using satellite and worry? We can deliver broadly two things. The one thing is in the left part. We can show you a high resolution quantification of optimized emissions. This is the total emission and all source sector being together. So, what can we use? How this figure can be useful? And the, uh, again, the orange, uh, reddish color gives you high, high emissions. And the, 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 the blue color give you low emissions. There are some really red dots, like right here. These are the, 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 the big dots we identify as a large missing hotspots, which means the mitigation priority. If we only have this much budget to reduce missing emission, that should be the priority. That's a direct guidance for it. Then meanwhile, we are able to attribute these emissions to individual countries and to individual sectors. 
We are able to do that for each of the 23 countries in this region. I take Algeria as an example. Algeria is here. I didn't know where it is before studying this. <laughs> so using Algeria as an example, you have to go see reported all the source sectors. And we are able to report the same for each single sector. We find our work, we basically find always find much larger emissions than the UFCCC reporting. The, the biggest difference is the gas. Gas is the largest source. So in Algeria, the, why the gas emission is so much larger than it's reported? The reason is when this uh, oil gas uh, well being produced, they want the oil, they don't want the gas. Even though they want the gas, they do not have the ability to track away because all these oil gas wells are really in very remote sites. You want to track it back to the city to be used, that's very difficult. So they just let it wreck. That's what they do. That's what they uh, also, we, we want to communicate better with them to give solutions. That's why we have much higher uh, gas emissions. And so in total, for the answer in total, we find 3.3 teragram emission, much larger than 2.2, as they report to UFCCC. I want to show you something we find really interesting. As I just mentioned, so how this country even build an uh, inventory? The uh, IPCC suggested you use the uh, production data to like how many barrels of uh, oil being produced from your country times a emission factor. That's the way to do that. And but we find no, the production is actually not correlated with the emission at all. For example, the figure <coughs> here, the blue color gives you the production of each country, the orange color gives you the emission. You find no, they have no correlation at all. Saudi Arabia gives you the largest uh, production of uh, oil in this region, but its emission is not that much. And uh, on the other side, Turkmenistan, the oil production is very low, but the emission is so high. Same thing we can find for, for the gas, it's, a, it's a exactly the same thing. So we find it's actually not production, it's a local infrastructure, the local measurement that drives the, the, the oil gas emissions. I'll take Turkmenistan as an example. Turkmenistan uh, used to be part of the Soviet Union. So its equipment is really old. Can, they are still used, it goes back to the Soviet Union era. So the equipment is so old, the measurement is poor. A lot of times they have like the pipeline liquid like this. They don't even know, they don't even care. So that's actually the main reason that it drives the, the uh, oil gas emissions. So that's the first point. The second point is uh, probably the, one of the most important findings is uh, it's highlighted the importance of a top-down top estimate, especially satellite in Warren in UFCCC reporting and the current policy. Uh, another concept we find pretty interesting is mass intensity. It's defined by the industry. The industry suggests that its uh, definition is mass emission from oil gas activity over the production. So a uh, couple years back, a very big oil gas company, the Exxon Mobil, BP and Shell, they built up together they, uh, with a climate initiative, OGCI. They set the industry target. In 2017, they want the 0.3% uh, mass intensity. Like only 0.3% is being emitted to the atmosphere. All the others being collected, used as production. That's their goal. And uh, the ambition is by 2025, they're going to reach 0.2%. That's an ambitious goal or it's a doable goal, we don't know. So we ask the question where we are now using our satellite finding. We're not there yet. We are far away from it. This is uh, the mass intensity from a range of countries. First thing we notice, it's a really wide range from roughly 20% for Iraq to very low, lower than 0.1% from Qatar. And you might wonder, where's the US? US is shown in the blue column here, roughly at 2.5%. The y-axis is a little bit weird built. But US is also not even there. So we ask why? Why such a large range? For these countries, the top 10 uh, countries, uh, they have very high uncertainty. We find for all these countries, they either have very leaky infrastructure or the deliberate venting and flare flaring, and in fact, they should be able to collect it. All the poor measurement, as I just mentioned about Turkmenistan. But we really, when we look at the problem, we really should see the light of the tunnel. That's how we go through COVID. And uh, you look at the good side of the country, like uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. They reach the target. 
So this target is actually doable. The reason that able to reach this target, it could be the concentrated operation. For Qatar, for example, they build an industry city, so all the oil and gas equipment all being there. So if it's concentrated, it's so easy to operate, so easy to manage. And also, they capture the associated gas. Associated gas is just uh, the oil, oil wells. They want the oil, probably they don't want the gas. Then it's associated. If they capture that, then that's a win-win. And also, there's a modern infrastructure being built. Being built. So the takeaway of this figure is the industry target is actually doable. So if we, for all these countries, all these 23 countries, they reduce their gas <coughs> intensity to 0.2%, we will be able to achieve a 26% decrease of total anthro projected emission of this region. Remember the global medicine pledge, the target is 30%. That will make a really big long way to go. So the takeaway for the first part of my work, me is good. It can effectively optimize and separate emissions by sector and by country, can guide the climate action. And the mass intensity are largely determined by the uh, local infrastructure and measurement, not production. And it highlights the importance of top-down estimate. So the industry target of 0.2% is actually doable, achievable. So it would go a long way towards meeting the global medicine pledge. This is uh, the ending of the first part of my work. I'm going to move to the second part, the mystery, that I've been obsessed with in the last couple of years. So uh, I'm going to talk about how rice has been growing in Africa, being uh, linked to this amazing rice. I have a very short story paper published in Nature Climate Change. I'll briefly go over what's going on. Speaking of rice, I grew up in East Area. So for a really long time, we see a lot of rice food. The Japanese sushi, the Korean rice cake, the Chinese rice tofu, the Vietnam rice doodle. You might have all of them. So for a long time, I, I live in my small world. I think, OK, rice is just, just, just some alien food. Then I begin to look at, at the Africa. I got really humbled to learn rice is actually a major source of food in Africa, too. So in year 2020, rice is the third most consumed staple of food, only after cassava and corn. It's even larger than uh, millet and wheat. So, and this is a, uh, a figure that shows the jollof rice, very typical food in West Africa. It's uh, mixed with some pepper, looks spicy and uh, delicious. With this mindset, Africa grows a lot of rice. But with this mindset, they talk about science again. Speaking back of this amazing rice, scientists have been fighting with each other on what's going on here all kinds of ex explanations. There are people talking about that's because of increase in biogenic emissions being going on. There are also being voiced that's uh, intuitively because of the higher and higher demand for fossil fuel energy. We need, so that gives increasing fossil fuel emissions. And there are also uh, opinion about, OK, there's an increase in wetland, increase in livestock everywhere in the world that contribute to the missing rice. And meanwhile, there's a source end. By the sink end, OH. OH is uh, like, um, a pigment in the atmosphere. It's a cleaning agent that eats up a lot of things in the atmosphere, like a, a methane CO and a non methane VOC. So, if uh, the idea is if uh, there's a decrease in the pigment, the de decreasing amount of pigment in the atmosphere, then the methane is going to go up. That's one another opinion here. But uh, I argue here, rice could, uh, oh sorry, not that yet. So, in the last couple of years, because we have a better understanding of the knowledge, we have a more and more satellite data give you better uh, observation, better coverage. People tend to believe it's a tropical Africa. It's a, the major corporate. The, there are many two voices. I want to really highlight the wetland hypothesis. So for wetland in the, in the tropics, the idea is because of intensified climate feedback. The, the, argu the argument is the rising temperature in uh, tropical Africa they're going to stimulate the microbial activity and the water. So there are more methane being produced. Meanwhile, there's a more frequent rainfall in Africa. They're going to simply make the wetland much larger. So all these two reasons added together give you much larger methane emission from the tropical Africa. And uh, meanwhile, there's uh, the livestock in Africa be growing. The, this argument is pretty straightforward because of the growing population of livestock. 
But the I go here, rice, is really should uh, play a role, at least join the conversation. The reason is, in year 2008, because of the financial crisis, the rice price goes up really high. So the African people, they cannot afford rice anymore, importing rice. So they decide to grow their own. There are 23 countries, sub-Saharan African countries, as shown in the green color here. They decide to grow their own rice. So as it, the goal is, for the first phase, to, from year 2008 to 2018, they want to double the rice production. And in the next 10 years, they want to double the production again, and ultimately reach the rice self-sufficiency. That's a goal. And uh, very happily, by the end of 2018, they reached the goal. The first phase goal was achieved, but largely through the area expansion. As shown in this figure here, the blue shows the entire Africa. The orange color gives you the sub-Saharan Africa, the 23 countries. So before 2008, we see an increase rapid 2.23 million hectares per year. And then after that, because of the revolution, it goes up much faster, 0.6 times, that's three times larger. By the end of 2018, the entire Africa gives you 16 million hectare rice area. Is it large, is it small? We can easily compare it to China. China is the world's largest rice producer. It has roughly 30 million hectares. 16 versus 30, it's quite comparable. Meanwhile, we have the U.S. giving rice uh, roughly one million. So, what does it mean to us? The rice area being much larger. That means a lot of medicine to us from this rice paddies. So, unfortunately, there's a, such a wide range land use change, but it's been totally ignored by emission inventories. We, we look at all the inventories, none of them even consider such land use change, such a revolution in Africa. We don't know why. So what do we do? We recalculate, we take into consideration of the land use change. We do the <coughs> calculation again. So what do we find as shown in the, the, the two panels here? The left one is the mean emission for the 10 years. And the, the, uh, the right one shows the trend during the 10 years. So what do we find? We find a mean emission from uh, this region at the country scale, country level, for the 10 year mean, roughly will be 2.6 teragrams. But for existing inventory, it gives you roughly 1.5. We'll find a much larger result. What's even more shocking is the trend. The trend is from 2008 to 2018. We find a 0.2 teragram per year increase. And the inventory is only giving you 0.04. That's five times difference. So given such much larger trend, we find the African rice cultivation driven by a farming uh, revolution contributes to almost 7% of the recent, recent rise in atmospheric medicine. So for that medicine rise, red line, so African rise can almost explain almost 10% of it. It's not a lot. It's not a significant, but it's something. It's a previously ignored, and uh, it should really join the conversation, should be considered. Actually, I want to talk about this work because it uh, really motivates my last talk. So the takeaway for this topic is, uh, I really want to highlight, but Africa, the population in Africa is rising the, the, the fast compared to Asia, America. So that means the rapidly growing uh, population is going to drive, probably drive more aggressive rice retention, more the like, bigger rice area could probably happen in the next couple of years, which is something should be considered in climate change mitigation uh, goals. And uh, the second point is uh, I want to highlight is the inventory, existing emission inventory, they fail to estimate uh, rice emission in Africa. They are not good. So that, the sec second point really drives my last uh, project I want to talk about today. Last project, I use a land emission satellite, which really do not measure medicine. I use that to build a global scale uh, methane, emission, methane emission inventory from rice paddies. I'll go back later with more detail for this figure. So indeed, we talk about uh, there are high uncertainty uh, for the rice emission in Africa. Actually, the high uncertainty is almost everywhere in the globe. The globally, the uh, global methane budget will be a range of 25 to 40 kilograms, which is a large range, a really wide range. And the, the, the right two panels give you a 
the, the middle panel shows the special pattern from Edgar. Edgar is a widely used uh, emission inventory. They, they have uh, all kinds of greenhouse gas or the air pollutants being widely used. This is the area, uh, the, the rice emissions. Look at this figure. I do not need to be an uh, expert in rice. I do not need to be an uh, uh, expert in medicine. I do not need to be an uh, expert in anything. I can probably tell this figure is wrong. The reason is, if you look at the India, look at the, the Southeast Asian countries, look at uh, J uh, Korea and Japan, they grow rice everywhere. That's unlikely. Where, where do people even live? It's unlikely you grow rice almost everywhere in the country. And also, the most rice panel shows the, 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 the months that the emission reach is mixing. And uh, that's quite uh, striking as, for example, the entire China, the emission which is a peak in June, and the entire India, which is peak in August. That's unlikely. You can simply tell, okay, they probably use uh, the country as a borderline to decide which month they should pick. If I'm a farmer, a girl rice here and here, they are probably just uh, uh, 10 meters away. But how can the, the rice even tell, okay, we are different countries, we should pick at a different time? That's simply wrong. So at this time, I feel really uh, determined and also passionate that I want to build a new uh, inventory for rice paddies globally and monthly. Yes, and and the, if the special patterns and the temporal patterns are all wrong, it's very difficult to give us like a, a effective emission control strategies. So, if I want to build a new rice inventory, uh, how it should look like? You should really should have a really high resolution. Also, have a described sensitivity really well. How should I even do that? And also. I talk about the last uncertainty is uh, where the rice is, how the rice change from season to season. So we think about how a land emitting satellite, which doesn't make <coughs> medicine at all, how it can potentially help. So if I look at the calculation, emissions equals rice area times emission factor. The emission factor is simply emission per unit of rice area. It's not that difficult. So let, let's do it. So before we do the calculation, let's take one step back to think about how rice paddy even produce and emit uh, medicine. So we talk about the flooding, cut of oxygen supply to soil, and the organic matter, <coughs> organic matter be decomposed in an anaerobic environment, give you medicine, that's how medicine produce. And so how medicine produce in the soil finally get out? There are three major pathways. It could be diffused out, and also sometimes you, you walk by the ocean, you see some bubbling, that's also the same thing for the rice paddies. They can be bubbling, bubbling out. And, uh, but I want to point out, the major pathway is actually the rice plant. So more than 90% of these massive emissions is escaped from the plant's leaves and the stems. They have some slony tissue called erythema. It grows bigger as the rice grows bigger. So the red pie shows the, shows the, the rice growth at a different stage. So as a rice grow bigger, there are more medicine can be escaped from plants. There are also, in the soil, more organic matter can be decomposed to give you medicine. So the, the takeaway for this slide is, the major way for medicine to escape is, uh, the, is the plants, and also the phenology of the rice matters. So based on this uh, slide, if we summarize a little bit, if you want to estimate rice paddy extent, what we should know? The most fundamental information we want to make sure if it is a rice paddy, right? And then for this rice paddy, we want to know if, it's a, if it is even flooded. And also we want to know the inundation vegetation extent during, from month to month. So use one sentence to summarize this. We want, what data we want? We want the seasonal rice paddy map with inundated extent at a really high resolution. How can we possibly do that? We need satellite. So Landsat satellite that can be used to map open water and inundated vegetation at a really high centimeter resolution. Landsat was uh, launched uh, by NASA, but operated by different uh, institutions, NASA, NOAA, USGS. And uh, uh, it's been launched in uh, the first generation in 1972. So it's been in service for more than 20, uh, 50 years. So Currently, it adds its generation nine. There will be a, a Landsat next launch in 2030. It's coming. So 
it uh, observes the, uh, the spectral band, the visible near infrared and the short wave infrared band, quite a range, wide range. So that's why it can be used to map rise. So what do we do? What do we get? We get our uh, satellite imagery. That's uh, all we have when we when we, when we beg for the Landsat for data. That's all we get. After we get this Landsat archive imagery, we what do we do? We what information do we need? We need to decompose. We need to know for this this pixel. We need to how much is the water, how much is the soil, how much is vegetation, and then it's just like a multiple linear fit, and we uh, decompose it to get that information, and then we bring extra help like the elevation, uh, because rice usually grows in very low lying area, so such information being used, and then we train our model, our model extensively for rice mapping. So. Now we revisit the calculation, the how we get the emission. For the rice area, it was in our data synergy. This is taken care of. Now we move to the most right path emission factor. So most inventories, like, uh, like Edgar, we just talked about, they use the IPCC suggest, suggested emission factors. But they are usually at a continental or like subcontinental scale, which lacks field validation. This figure here. The, the, the purple color here gives you the Southeast area. All these countries, IPCC suggests to use the same value. It's 1.22 kilogram per hectare per day. That means high uncertainty. Because based on the measurement, we find for different countries, from Philippines to Vietnam, the measurement best image factor ranges from roughly 1 to 3.6. That's a really big range. But if we go with this value, it means high bias for these regions. So what do we do? We instead we don't use the IPCC value. We use the measurement based country scale emission factors. So we revisit this function again. Rest area emission factor everything is taken care of. So we can finally show you some result. Yeah, this is a global map. How we estimate the annual mean rest emissions. So outside from the, the left part. We find the rice, a lot of rice in U.S. and uh, of course California, the San Juan Valley, and also a lot, a lot of rice emission from uh, Louisiana, Texas, Missouri. And if we move to Africa, that's quite encouraging to support my second topic. We do use satellite find a lot of uh, rice emissions from uh, Africa, and the the biggest part of course is area China and uh, India. Bangladesh and the southeast countries. So, yeah, that's a that's our annual mean product to present. But globally, we find 30 point, 39 point three teragram uh, emissions. Uh, com quite comparable at the high end of the existing bottom inventory. China, India, and Bangladesh, the lead the country. They are the the, the, the top three uh, rice producers. We find it's also the top three rice em emitters. And also the U.S. U.S. give you 1.3, quite a considerable large like uh, rice emissions, larger than we expected. Uh, what's more useful, more important, is we are able to deliver the result of synergy. Existing inventories, they either do not have the synergy or they describe it very poorly, like an Edgar. But uh, we are able to show it. This is uh, the, the, the error part. As you can look at from a uh, from January going up, temperature goes up, you begin to see emissions popping up from the south to north. I wait for it. Yes, finally showing up. From the central south part of China until the northeast of China. You see the emissions show up based on the season. Also in the right part that shows the US. You see first you show emission emissions from Texas and then going up to Louisiana, Missouri, and also California. So in the next, I want to break down to some uh, very interesting countries that uh, I found uh, I want to talk about, also kind of related to my future work. The first one is India. Yeah, this part is India. You find the uh, emissions in the north part, also a big part of here. And uh, it's almost all red because the temperature is high. The temperature is high, so these uh, emissions uh, from this region is also high. And uh, the red panel gives you seasonality. The synergy is uh, quite not as I expected because we almost only see high emission from July to October. So we ask why. And uh, it happened, we happen to know 
from June to October in the India summer monsoon season. During this time period, 80% of the annual rainfall falls on in this month, this many months. And uh, India is a country very different from the US, different from China. The country heavily rely on rainfall. So it makes sense the farmers want to want to grow rice in June or July. Actually, July is a picking planting months. So now it makes sense. Like uh, the, the rice being growing here and see it grows high emissions. And this, this time at the ending of the monsoon season, it's harvest. So rice is taken out. So that's why we see the rice emissions only during the monsoon season. And uh, another country is right here. It's called Bangladesh. It's uh, surrounded by India that I want to talk about a little bit. It's red. It's all red. It's a small country. But uh, based on our data, it's the third largest rice producer, only after China and India. And uh, if you look at the emission, it's so close to India. It's a, a neighbor of India, but its emission salinity is so different. And then we look it up, we realize that um, for this country, rice is harvested three times a year. So basically, we grow rice all year around. That's why we see high emissions. Um, the, if you look, compare uh, India and Bang Bangladesh, it's not surprising. Yes, uh, India is Im impacted by monsoon season, and uh, Bangladesh grow rice all year round. That's why seasonality. The beautiful part of our method, of our, our landscape mapping, we don't know that. We don't tell our model, okay, uh, India heavily impacted by monsoon season. The Bangladesh grow rice three, uh, three times a year. We don't, we don't need to tell the model, we don't need to tell the landscape mapping, but they, can, they are able to capture the difference. That's the beautiful part of our work. Or the same thing in the future is the local policy change, how they use the water, the policy change. Also something happened in China, in, in US, we are able to uh, implicitly just use satellite to capture the difference. That's a beautiful part that saves us a lot of effort. You might wonder, because I always wonder, why do you work on the rice emission. Rice, we rely on rice for food. Like scavenging is a more, much bigger problem than greenhouse gas. Then how can you think about reduced rice emissions? When we think about reduced rice emission, we are actually asking how can we reduce rice emissions? And meanwhile, we want to guarantee the food security. That's a real problem, right? So I'll give you a couple of options. The first one is we develop a, a new high yield cultivar with a low uh, methane gas emissions. The idea is if uh, for this cultivar, this seeding, it doesn't need that much water. So that means a lot of time it doesn't even need to be flooded. So there's no methane emissions. And also there's a, a non-continuous flooding practice. A lot of the scientists from Louisiana recently told us for, for the most of the time the flooding is going on all season, but in the middle of it, if you even you take the water out, can still guarantee the very high emissions. That uh, guarantees the high yields, and uh, it doesn't, uh, but meanwhile, a lot of methane is being reduced. And uh, the third one is uh, the uh, reduce, uh, we, after the harvest from last season, we take the straw out instead of uh, keeping it in, 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 the, in the farmlands. Because if we keep the uh, straw uh, in the farmlands, it will be incorporated into soil. There are more organic matter being used to produce medicine. And uh, the last uh, but not least is my favorite, ducks. So we, uh, ducks are pretty naughty. We put the little ducks and, uh, in the, in, in the rice right, right farmlands. They're pretty naughty, they move around. And they move around all the time, so deep and devil, and they disturb the water. So more oxygen goes into the water, then there are more the organic matter uh, doesn't have the opportunity to produce medicine. Even though they are produced as a medicine, they get access to oxygen. It's being consumed. So no medicine get, gonna, is, is kept. So the scientists in Southeast area, they've been testing, roughly putting ducks there. It's like a win-win, give you like 25% uh, medicine reduction over, the, over one season. So it's uh, quite friendly and sustainable. So for our finding, we use the uh, Landsat data to develop a new high resolution inventory. For 50 years, the Landsat has been in service. For the first time, we look at the, this valuable satellite again. We wonder what new aspect, what new perspective can we use the, the, the satellite data. Now, now we find one. In the future, we hopefully can find more because rice, legs, wetland, they're similar, like uh, water, vegetation. So same method, 
we can use a little bit of machine learning to train our model. So it can be applied to medicine mapping for natural wetland and the lakes in the future. And uh, our inventory shows very large improvement in terms of the seasonality and the spatial pattern, which is very useful in guiding mitigation. That's uh, the three topics, the current and the previous topics I want to cover today. It's already covered. So since the graduate school, I was always asked a question, if you can only use one sentence to describe what you do. So based on, thanks for that training, I'm able to think about it from that direction. My one sentence life summary is using satellite data and models to better understand emissions across, across different spatial and temporal scales. So it is the heart of my work is to use such good emission data, make sure they are visible and actionable. That's uh, my one sentence summary of my previous three works. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about moving forward and moving beyond my future work. Uh, potentially. So I want to pitch to you a framework that advances the carbon climate understanding using satellite and models. I just talked about the satellite as a measurement thing. Now Tropomi and Go said there are a lot more I show in the in the in the, in the figure. Then there are also land, land imaging satellite. It has a longer history than the machine measurement uh, satellite. Like land set sentinel two can go back uh, 40 years, 50 years. And uh, there are all to bring in new, like meteorology data, like the uh, GOES R or the TRMM is already retired, but it could be useful if we look back to the, uh, to the past. Meanwhile, we have GeoScan, WolfCam, the chemical transport model, which relate emission to observe concentration. Using this system, what we can get? We can get very high resolution, good emission data. Meanwhile, we correlate the emission data to a uh, long record detailed climate patterns, temperature, precipitation, and amino lamina. We can have a better understanding of the carbon climate relationship in the system. Then, this understanding, better understanding, is all reflected in the blue arrow. Showing the blue arrow, we put this understanding to an Earth system model, like CSM. They observe what's going on. So, we use that to optimize the parameters, the process in the Earth system model. So, what we can do? We can predict future medicine well in a changing climate. That's what we want to know, right? So there are two broad applications of this framework. The first one is about the anthropogenic emissions. I have a little very uh, rough figure here. Temperature, rainfall, how are you gonna impact the medicine, anthropogenic medicine emissions. I forgot to put the echo. There could also be temperature, rainfall interaction, how it can impact medicine. So there are rest heading, as I just talked about. In, in India, the monsoon season highly impacts the massive emission from rice paddy. This is a dry year, this is a wet year. From year to year, it really differs because India heavily rely on rainfall. And the same thing for manure management. Manure management, when the temperature is high, it also stim stimulates the microbial activity and give you higher emissions. And also there's the landfills. Landfills, um, I, I have to point out three of the 10 largest Landfill emitters are in Florida. One reason is because Florida is hot. So when it's hot, same thing, the microbial activity, food waste. When the food waste, organic food waste being there, high temperature and the food, it smells for sure. And then it's gonna decay, give you medicine as a byproduct. Also, say this year has a lot of rainfall. If there's a lot of rainfall, then the, the air is gonna be really humid. If the, in a humid environment, what do we feel? we feel like we cannot breathe, right? The same thing for the, for the landfills. The lack of oxygen creates a more anaerobic environment for more medicine being produced and emitted and gonna give a global warming a, a, a hint. So the problem is the impact of the climate on the emission, uh, anthropic emission seasonality for these source sectors is never studied. The poorly understood, we don't know. And for example, we ask question, how do these emissions respond in an El Nino year? How do these emissions respond in a La Nina year? We really don't know. And it's gonna be, give us a really difficult time to predict the future methane emissions. What's been even worse is uh, for current mitigation measures, such uh, factors never considered. That's the biggest, that's one big uncertainty. If uh, 
take India for example. If this year is really a lot of rainfall, then they gonna give you, of course, give you very high emissions. Then at this time, the mitigation measure is the same standard for the euro year. It's not fair. It's not fair for India. So this is something we should consider. We need a better understanding of the carbon climate relationship to guide mitigation effort, even though currently it's being fully ignored. That's uh, one topic, anthropogenic emissions. We, can, we are able to do something we can do. And uh, move from anthropogenic emission to natural emission, natural wetland. Wetland is really complicated. The wetland in Florida, for sure, and also in, tropic, in the tropics and in the boreal. And uh, wetland is really sensitive to climate. The figure by IPCC shows uh, the temperature change in the last two decades. We can find the temperature rise really, really fast over the boreal region. So there are a lot of boreal wetland going to really respond to this high temperature. Meanwhile, there's a temperature increase in the Africa. So that how boreal wetland and uh, tropical wetland respond to temperature, we don't know that. Also, there's rainfall. Rainfall pattern itself is complicated. We probably don't even know or have a good confidence in how rainfall going to change in the next 10 years. So that's uh, another uncertainty. So why do we have a poor understanding about uh, wetland emissions? I think the biggest part is we need more knowledge about climate. By saying we, I mean me, like the greenhouse gas community. So the idea is uh, we really need to know the temperature and the rainfall patterns. We need to know El Nino and La Nina. So um, I know something about medicine, but you know much better than I do about climate. There's something we can work together to figure out. What do we need? We need to, we, we, we lack of reliable wetland extent data, but uh, s such difficulty can be achieved using the landscape mapping as a, the same method I do for rice. It's, it's going to be time consuming, but we need a really long decadal record, the seasonal record of the water we do need. We need a wetland map. We need to know where the wetland is. We need to know the wetland emissions. And also, we need to know the climate patterns. So, with that, we can have a better understanding of the carbon climate relationships in tropical wetland, borrow wetland, Florida wetland. So, we can better predict the future medicine in a changing climate. So finally, we can able to look at the, the wetland emissions in the past, into history. We, we can finally explain how wetland, yes or no, they are able to explain at least partially part of this uh, missing rise. And how the future going to change, going to go flat or going to go up again. This is something, if, with this better understanding, we are able to answer, we are able to give a really confident answer in the future. So that is a... Uh, the, the, the main thing, question I want to explore. So move forward and move beyond. I want to move beyond a little bit. This is uh, the idea I've been thinking since uh, I studied uh, graduate school 10 years ago. It's been a while. So I'm always thinking, thinking of a, a big picture of agriculture, say the US Corn Belt, the Midwestern region. When we apply nitrogen fertilizer, it gives us from the farmland, nitrogen oxide is the third most largest uh, greenhouse gas, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas. And then, meanwhile, the manure, we talk about the manure in methane, thing, but it also it gives us N2O. And it also, of course, the carbs give you methane emissions. Meanwhile, we talk about land conversion, deforestation, the land conversion to farms. Why is the trees, grassland being removed, a lot of CO2 being released? The question to ask is how them, in total, overall, contribute to climate change? how agriculture as one single thing contribute to global warming in terms of greenhouse gas. It's, it's not possible to do like 10 years ago, but now we have satellite data. Satellite data can co-locate this region, can <coughs> co-locate the timing, and give you, for each species, give you the, the, the seasonal and interannual variability of each single emissions. Then with that, we can calculate the radioactive forcing of it so we are able to advance understanding of the overall impact of agriculture on climate change. We simply need one value. We, we want to say, people ask you, oh, okay, in the past 20 years, how the agriculture practice in the US corn belt has contributed to global warming. Do we know that number? We don't, but we should. So that's the idea I want to work on for a long time. Now that's uh, finally an opportunity to use satellite data. So for my last, uh, idea I want to pitch here 
It's a movement beyond greenhouse gas. I want to study greenhouse gas air pollutants. Coal emitters. This is a, a power plant. Like after combustion, what do we have? We have CO2, greenhouse gas. Uh, carbon monoxide, NOx, PM2.5, air pollutants. So they have a climate impact, they have an air pollution, air pollution, uh, air quality impact. So they are often studied individually, separately, because we care about different things. But they really should be studied together. Because uh, an easy selling point is reduce such emission source can give you benefit, both benefits, co-benefits cool in climate and also air quality. Same thing I can argue for wildfire and nitrogen fertilizer. So again, before it's not impossible, but uh, such co-emitters have an impact on climate and air quality. Reducing them give you both benefits. Now, we have satellite data. We jointly leverage satellite data for the same timing, for the same location, co-located. We're able to get both the, the information from greenhouse gas and the air pollutants. So we are able to calculate the, the total, the overall impact of it. One advantage of it is that CO2 is well mixed to the atmosphere. So you might not be able to see the signal that well because it's so well mixed. But the NOx is so different. NOx, the lifetime is much shorter. So when it's being emitted, the background is almost zero. So you can easily see the NOx signal. So say, give the satellite data, you are able to see the NOx signal so well. And then we have a good understanding of the relationship between NOx and CO2. We are able to use the NOx observant satellite to map the CO2 emissions in North America, in China, into the globe. That's the idea. So uh, yeah, this is my last slide. I want to use satellite models, uh, chemistry transfer models, and also earth system models to study methane and move, move forward to greenhouse gas, and then move forward to greenhouse gas and air pollutants. That's uh, all I have for today. Thank you so much. Okay. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a couple of small questions. Uh -huh. um, for when you're, you're modeling things with methane from oxidants, are you only including the hydroxyl radical, or are you looking at uh, other oxidant sources? Uh, what's the question? Sorry. When you're, when you're modeling uh, mm -hmm. Like methane sinks to oxidation? Uh -huh. Are you only including the hydroxyl radical or are you including like a broad range of oxygen sources? Uh, the mainly as a, 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 a hydro and also soil uptake. Okay, so you're looking at like methanotropic activity? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then for rice patties, has like methanotrophs been characterized on there? Do they not really hang out um, at rice patties or is that not well known? Uh, what's going on? Sorry. Yeah. Within your rice patty kind of flux or outward yeah. flux of methane, uh -huh. do we not usually see like methanotropes in living near the rice paddies or? Oh, you mean the, the process? Yeah, do we, is there no sink of methane? Oh, there is, like there bacteria? is, yeah, like uh, after it's being, uh, methanogenesis being produced, yeah. most of it also, meanwhile, being consumed, but still, based on the flooding situation and the oxygen, some yeah. of them just escape. Yeah, yeah. and that, that that emission factor that you pointed out was the total Just state. emission, yeah, the net. Okay. In fact, uh, that process is a fundamental knowledge gap. We don't know. Yeah. Not good enough. Uh, yes, well line too, yeah. Yes. Uh, Brian? Are there any isotope clues to this methane surge? There is. There is for the biogenic. That's uh, people attribute to uh, biogenic. That's from isotope. But uh, as you know, the NOAA, the isotope uh, network is so sparse. And also in locations like we don't understand why, so remote. So they can broadly attribute it to chocolate Africa, to biogenic source. That's, uh, that's it. Yeah. But you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, what caused methane to plateau and stop increasing before it increased again? I don't know. No one knows. Yes. It's a, uh, <laughs> it, it, yes. It's a, uh, I really don't know, but I, yeah, that I can have a couple of guests like the OH being uh, doing a better work in, 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 in eating up thing. Meanwhile, I don't know the, the, the fossil fuel industry in the last couple of years, that many years, it's not that booming, but we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. You wanted to ask about um, the, the air pollutants and uh -huh. um, their potential radiative impacts as well, which you mentioned to me, that um, the associated, you know, 
secondary aerosols that can arise mm -hmm. through, through these through the nitrogen pathway. Mm -hmm. That um, what would be? Can you quanti Can you think about quantifying the climate impact of that? Because that's you know, it's uh, it's actually kind of works from a climate perspective. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's it has the opposite effect. Yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's a yes. That's that's a question make it really complicated. I uh, I do not have a great good answer for it, but certainly yes, it's it's been there. But more likely, like we we, we consider from like a long lived like a species perspective, right. possibly the the long lived uh, like a, a CO two are gonna have a. a yeah, that will stay around. Right? Yes, they're around. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so the time horizon, but still, you could. I mean, if you think that there's like these are long term, you know, emissions uh -huh. trends. Yes, right? yes. And so you have, you know, you have greenhouse gases coming out. Uh huh. Yeah. You ha and you have particles yes. that are forming as a result of uh -huh. these gas emissions. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. And so, what is the climate impact of those particles? Can you quant? Do you think you could get to quantifying that? Oh, uh, we uh like. We if you want to quantify the uh, Amy's question, is that they give you particles. Particles are like aerosol, give you aerosol cooling. It's the opposite direction of greenhouse gas. How are we able to quantify that? Uh, from uh, the answer is yes. So there, now that we have satellite data, give you really good coverage of the uh, LD, aerosol optical gas, the quantity of the aerosols. And we, uh, that's uh, actually good, good enough information for us to quantify its cooling effect. Okay. Meanwhile, because meanwhile, we have the, we might don't know about like in this room, like how much is the natural aerosol, how much is the software aerosol. Yeah. But in general, we have a good sense, like the, the fraction of which is which, then it's good enough to give us the, the okay. total cooling globally. Okay. Yeah, and that information we, well good, yeah. And regionally as well though. Regionally too, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, if we know the fire good enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there any information in seasonal trends? Like, have you looked at that? If if the trends in methane mm -hmm. are more obvious in, say, you know, summer months than winter months, does that tell you something that it's? It, I'm thinking of that global yes. trend line. That there, yes, that's a, the, the part of our work we publish in JL. Like you, the seasonal thing, if you look at the, the methane concentration from satellite data, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, basically it's been uh, going down always until sum, uh, like boreal summer, and it's going to be really picking up since July. Because the temperature is higher, the, the, the wetland, all these uh, wetland, like uh, the tropical wetland is in North Hemisphere. The temperature war warms up. That's this, this a hypothesis. Like uh, really uh, picking up the, 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 the concentration going on. That's, uh, that's a hy hypothesis. Yes, like, so picking up since uh, July to going up. Uh, what, uh, that, that, uh, that, what does that give us information is our current geoscan cannot reproduce the observed seasonality. So that means something is missing in the inventory used for juice can. That's uh, I, for me. That's the information we can dig further. We know something is missing. So that's why my guess is why the observation picking up since July, but uh, but the models can never pick it up. What's being missing? I think it's wetland in the Africa. Also other things that sensitive to temperature. At that time, a large scale emission being really uh, booming up by temperature, so that gives us high emissions. But that's uh, currently still people being argue with that all the time. That's my guess. Why wouldn't it be the high latitude wetlands? Uh, high, currently, the borough wetland is not that many. Like, uh, it's, uh, the corporate is still the tropical Africa. That's uh, a recent path. Uh, first of all, we don't know the borough wetland good enough. You say that data cannot see that north. It's too noisy, the data being there. And the, also the temperature there is not that high compared to the tropics. So even though the, it's, it's a large region, but still most of the time of the year, seasonally, is not sen that sensitive to give us massive emissions. That's a, the current situation. In the future, is definitely going to change. Yes, yeah.
Um, this is kind of an out, out of left field question, but in the northern wetlands that are not well understood, do you think like snow cover could affect the, the methane cycle that much? Or? Uh, the, the, the snow cover definitely affects the satellite data, we cannot see. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there are, when the snow, like uh, in the future, global warming, the snow is removed, then the, the, the permafrost there kind of be converted to wetland. Right. That's, uh, that's my guess. Uh, there, there might be a lot of uh, dead plants being there for, for hundreds of years. So that really opportunity for the medicine gas to be released all of a sudden. That's well, I know like your Harvard, where you work, there's a, a, a wetland that's kind of well studied. And I think that they've been trying to figure out the, I don't know if they're still doing it, uh, but when I lived around there, they're looking at like seasonality and methane emissions. So uh -huh. like, I forget if snow had an effect on it or not. I see. The, the, the wetlander emissions uh, for the, the tropical region is actually uh, different from region to region. That's why I said the wetland is so complicated. Before, think about Africa. I told Amy this. I said, how difficult can Africa be? Dry, dry season, wet season? That's it. And we even have a good understanding of which month is dry season, which month is the wet season. Turns out it's much more complicated. And how far away it's from the ocean, also the topography, all change the the, the patterns of rainfall temperature. They say it, it, the, the temperature pattern, rainfall pattern is so different from this area to that area, even in Africa. That gonna change the the the, the, the wetland emissions, the like seasonal variation. So I cannot give you a firm answer how the scenario should look like. Mm -hmm. It's really different. That's why I think the tropical wetland is so difficult to study. That's why I think the knowledge gap was hindering us from knowing better about the wetland is our knowledge in climate, which I don't know good enough. You know better than me. <laughs> yeah. 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 So with the new release of methane sand, sand yeah. like, is that going to help uh, identify some of these missing sources? Uh, they, they, they care about all your gas, unfortunately. Yes. Um, uh, methane said is a new satellite launched this uh, April. This April, it's, uh, it's funded by, by NASA. They, they give her uh, Harvard. It's uh, funded by EDF, sorry. And uh, they, they, they give her uh, Harvard $100 million new satellite. The unique part of being machine set is that their pixel is roughly at 200 meters. And by the by meanwhile, they are targeted. So every day, they are able to give you 30 targets. So it's actually, that's uh, the part I feel. I felt worried in one day. 30 targets every day. Which 30 targets? There are 300 targets, 3,000 targets you should care about. So how do you decide 30 targets every day? But they mostly care about the oil gas. And they also said they're going to focus on agriculture. But I think that many means livestock. Yes. Uh, but they're definitely going to give us... Uh, so because they, they have 200 meter resolution, you can see a little bit of point source. Meanwhile, a little bit of area source. That's going to be a unique... Uh, uh, perspective to look at the data. Yeah, this is a really good question. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.